Okay. All right. I think we'll get started. Uh, thanks for coming back. Um, uh, this is the second lecture of our of our uh, summer course, and we'll pretty much have two lectures a week. Uh, we won't have a lecture on July fourth uh, or you know that that time period. And um, we have pretty much the whole schedule figured out for the most part. But it might you know it, it might change here and there, and and so it's always a good idea to look at that that projection from a Google uh, sheet just uh, that you probably have all the links the link to but um, but either way uh, you also get announcements as well so I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much uh, uh, okay so um, so this this lecture is on uh, uh, it was kind of a fun one to make I had to uh, update it a lot because there's a lot of a lot of activity in this area and uh, a lot of controversy, a lot of new findings, a lot of false starts. Um, this is actually on uh, everything. So, so most of the field, I would say, ninety-eight percent of or ninety-nine percent of all the all the uh, functional MRI research being done on brain activation is, is using bold contrasts. So, and and these are all the contrasts that have either occurred historically or are occurring uh, that. That might be interesting. I mean, everyone's always trying for a better technique that's more localized to neural activity, that's less confounded by vessels, um, and and it, the field is very, very dynamic. It, it's filled with physicists, it's filled with engineers, uh, physiologists who all are, are sort of pushing the envelope on this. So okay, so this is actually going to be a shorter lecture than last time, but I, I will cover um, all 11 of these pretty quickly. And uh, so, so this is actually these are the all the non-bold contrasts uh, that I've that I've been able to to find uh, over the years. So perfusion, uh, blood volume using three different methods. Uh, actually, perfusion using two different methods, maybe three, but we'll we'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, quantitating the change in metabolic rate, and now there's even ways of looking at baseline. CMRO2, creating maps of baseline CMRO2 using MRI, uh, uh, looking at changes of blood volume, uh, and then some of the more experimental ones, neural currents, uh, looking at proton density. Some are even, some are extremely niche and not really verified, like seat contrast, which I'll mention briefly. Uh, diffusion coefficient, looking at the diffusion coefficient change, temperature change, elastography, and um, metabolic contrast. Metabolic contrast has been around longer than fMRI, um, and uh, we're just starting to understand how it, how metabolism, how metabolites change with activation. And it's more complicated than just uh, turning on and off. All right, so let's start with perfusion. I, I'm starting with IVIM because this actually preceded uh, all of fMRI. Uh, Denis Lebihan, in about 1986, uh, came up with this really nice idea while he was actually here at the NIH. He was a, a clinical fellow here at the NIH. Now he's leading a, a huge center in, in France. Um, and he came up with this technique, uh, and he's still writing about it today. Uh, he came up with this technique called IVIM, Intervoxel Incoherent Motion. Uh, and as I mentioned, he introduced it in radiology in 1986, and there's a really nice paper actually on it. So it's uh, really sort of an even-handed view uh, of, of, of it right now in NeuroImage, uh, and you can see that reference. It was just published in 2019 in, in a really nice special issue on physiologic MRI. Um, so the basic idea is this, is that when you apply diffusion weighting gradients uh, to do diffusion imaging, you're applying basically, basically a bipolar pulse, uh, a big a gradient, or a two, two uh, uh, unipolar polar pulses around a 180. And the idea here is that what it does is it any spins that are moving in position experience a different magnetic field, and they quickly become out of phase with other spins. And so depending on how sharp of a gradient you have in terms of the magnetic field, you are sensitized at different velocities of, of spin diffusion or different degrees of spin diffusion. So if you have a really uh, shallow gradient, spins will have to diffuse pretty far to become dephase. So it's, you're sensitive to very rapidly flowing or, or, or moving protons. If, it's, if the gradients are really high or really sharp, then you don't have to diffuse that far and you'll be completely dephased. 
And so basically, you first def dephase everything, and then you do the opposite gradient, and if the, the spins are stationary, they'll rephase, just back together, give you the signal back. But if they move at all, they'll be dephased, and the signal will be attenuated. So that's the basic concept of, of diffusion imaging. What Lebihan did is he thought, okay, so, you know, yes, you have, uh, when you're looking at any area uh, of the brain, any, any, any substance, you have spins diffusing. Uh, but at the same time, you have capillaries, too. You have capillary networks that are sort of a random network, and it's called pseudo-diffusion. He, he refers to it as that. And the idea is that the capillary network is random. The spins are, or the protons are, are, are moving in the blood, and they're moving very rapidly, much faster than diffusion, but it's still a random motion. And so if you apply just a little bit of diffusion weighting, then you can attenuate just the perfusing spins and therefore be sensitized to that. So his dream was to make these maps of perfusion using just a little bit of diffusion weighting. And the basic concept is here. So this is the attenuation in the signal that occurs with adding more and more diffusion weighting. And what's interesting, they, the amount of diffusion weighting, uh, since uh, Denis Lebihan sort of helped pioneer this, he, he came up with a term it's the B factor, and I think he, he, I think he stands for Led Bihan, I think, something like that. Maybe that's the, that's the story. But anyway, um, so the idea, the higher the B factor, the higher the gradients, uh, the, the more the signal becomes attenuated due to the fact that you're, more, you're attenuating more, slower and slower and slower diffusion. And, but he actually noticed one thing. At the very beginning of this curve right here, it, it deviates from a single exponential. And he attributed this to being caused by perfusion, or this apparent diffusion. And he said, okay, let's just image this attenuation, and we'll make maps of perfusion. And he made maps that looked like they looked like, you know, uh, follow grade white matter differences. Turns out that it actually didn't work at all. It, it failed quite dramatically. It failed actually just at the same meeting that bold contrast was introduced. Uh, it turns out that uh, this technique is extremely sensitive to... Uh, all pulsating, moving things. So, so it included motion as well as CSF. And plus it's extremely uh, low sensitivity. So it, it really didn't work at all. Um, uh, and he even says that in his most recent paper. But it really has other uses in other parts of the body that don't have pulsating CSF. So it's, it's potentially very useful. Um, so it didn't work in the, early 80, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, uh, but it was a nice idea, and actually, yeah, two days ago I mentioned, you know, one way of getting rid of intravascular signal is by adding diffusion weighting. Um, and that uh, essentially is the concept of IVIM that we're applying to get rid of the intravascular signal. So it's still kind of being manifest today. Um, uh, but it has many clinical applications, just not brain activation. Okay, blood volume. I went over a lot of this yesterday. Essentially... Uh, it was a method that was developed uh, mostly at MGH by Bruce Rosen. Uh, so you, uh, most of you know Bruce Rosen being the head of the Martino Center. One of the first things, one of the first big things that the Martino Center at MGH did was pioneer this technique. And uh, not for brain activation either, just simply to map out perfusion. It's used everywhere clinically now. So the basic concept, once again, is, is that you, give a, you collect a time series of images and you, you give a bolus injection of a paramagnetic contrast agent, uh, in this case, gadolinium. And that attenuates, that's like, that's like de making deoxygenated blood. It's, it's suddenly you have all these spins dephasing as they experience these this different magnetic fields uh, when they perfuse through. And so what happens then is that uh, uh, this is basically, you make a... Uh, a map of the integration under this curve. This is the wash in and wash out curve. And you can make a nice map of blood volume. The depth of this curve uh, is essentially proportional to the blood volume in each voxel. So it's great. It washes in, it washes out, disappears. And, it, and, and in some way, cases it affects the T1, but we won't get into that. Um, so with activation, there's a slightly faster arrival time and a slightly deeper wash in. There's a higher blood volume. Uh, and you can subtract these two maps and get a map like this of pure uh, blood volume changes. And it was great. It, it actually made the cover of science, which I'll show you in a second. And the basic concept, once again, is that you have a vessel right here that uh, has, uh, when, it, when something paramagnetic is inside of it, when it's in the magnetic field, it sets up these field distortions around it that, 
And basically, if this were perfectly flat, uh, then uh, all the protons would be experiencing uh, the same magnetic field, and they would all add up and, and create the signal. To the extent that it's all distorted, the, magnetic, the, the spins are experiencing different magnetic fields, and they spin at per different precession frequencies because of that, and they cancel each other out. So that's what causes that attenuation. And so one other graphical depiction, uh, this is courtesy Larry Wald, uh, you basically inject your gadolinium, this is a vessel, it washes in right here, oops, <laughs> barely, there we go, washes in, that sets up those distortions, and then it washes out, and you get that again. So that's what causes that signal drop. And like I said, it covered it. it made a huge splash. Uh, Jack Beliveau uh, won the Young Investigator Award at ISMRM uh, that year in 1991, uh, and it made the cover of Science in November of 1991. But never after this uh, issue of Science, it never again was really used as a braid activation method because, of course, it was invasive. It involved, you know, contrast agents, two steps. It was, it was kind of cumbersome. Okay, there's another uh, recent technique that, that just emerged about five years ago, I would say. Uh, there's another contrast agent that wasn't previously used as a contrast agent. It was actually, it's uh, fur furamoxetol. And essentially people who were, had iron deficits would take this either orally, and now you can take it intravenously. So, so people use it to increase the iron in the blood, just naturally. And um, uh, it, the, the cool thing about this is that it has a high susceptibility, just like gadolinium, but it doesn't wash out. It stays in the blood for 10 to 15 hours. So now you have this great contrast agent that you can use on humans that doesn't wash out. So you can actually look at, do brain activation uh, over and over and over again uh, with it. Uh, the problem is it's still a contrast agent, and it's still uh, the, the climate now in research is that you just don't inject contrast agents in people unless they you know, are patients who need the iron. Um, uh, but you can look at, so th this can be used to answer one of the key questions in fMRI is what causes these interesting blood uh, bold contrast dynamics, like the pre-undershoot and the post-undershoot? Is it the fact that the blood volume dynamics have a different timing? And turns out, actually, I, I just discovered this as I was making this talk, that, uh, that, that right here at the NIH, uh, Jeff Dunn's group uh, worked uh, with Danny Reich uh, in doing this uh, fermoxetol study. Uh, it's hard to get approval to do this. And, and so basically, this is what the signal looks like. This is before injection of the fermoxetol. This is simple bold. But when you inject the fermoxetol, you get this massive decrease in signal. Uh, as the blood volume goes up, there's more contrast agent that's there, and that causes the signal to go down. So you get this massive mirror image signal that dominates over bold completely. And they actually did the right experiment. They did an impulse response experiment where uh, they looked at before injection, and then after injection was this curve, but then they had the, they had the control for um, the, the bold contribution to that. So this was the pure blood volume change right here. And these are histograms where they showed something interesting. One is that, so the red, red histogram is bold. The other histograms are, the, the, the uh, blue is, is blood volume. And you can see that the overall, uh, there's, a, there's a spread in voxels, certainly in, in timing, but overall the blood volume change occurs well before the bold change. And this is, a, this is a new finding. I mean, this is really, really interesting. Um, that might explain the pre-undershoot that occurs that some people sometimes see. One other surprising finding is that with, after they normalized for bold, they found that the return to baseline took a little bit longer for blood volume, but not that much longer. And the full width half maximum wasn't any different either. So, so that was a really, really nice study. Uh, it's worth taking a look at that paper. People have done resting state as well uh, with furamoxetol. And on the left, this is basically, um, uh, this is before and after uh, uh, furamoxetol. This is on the left column is, is before. This is on the right column after. And one is blood volume resting state. The other is bold. They found that um, uh, 
they don't get much difference in terms of the signal to noise or the contrast, uh, but and the maps look somewhat similar. So this is a very preliminary study. Uh, there's really not that many studies out there using thiramoxetol. So, so that's something that's worth looking into more, but it's really hard to do. Perfusion. So I'm, once again, I mentioned this briefly two days ago. Just want to go over quickly uh, one more time. Uh, came out, uh, one of the pioneers in perfusion imaging was, was Alan Koretsky uh, and his group. Uh, basically, it involves, and it came out about the same time as, as bold contrast, about 1991. Basically involves uh, giving a, uh, a tag pulse and alternating that with a control pulse to control for RF, like magnetization transfer and things like that. Uh, and then any blood that was tagged with an RF pulse that flows into the plane that you're interested in looking will enhance or affect the magnetization or the signal there. So you can get nice maps of perfusion. And there's different strategies for uh, tagging. This is called echoplanar imaging with signal targeting and alternating RF. This is flow alternating inversion recovery. Different strategies. Basically, the idea, this tags from both sides. The other one tags from one side. And then you, you subtract the pairs of images. And you get things like this. So if you only wait 200 milliseconds after tagging, you get uh, bright dots, which is, just looks like an angiogram. It's all arteries. If you wait a second, you start getting true perfusion. Uh, and then you see really nice gray-white matter differences. Like I said, the problem is, is that the signal-to-noise relative to gadolinium injection to get perfusion is much lower. But after, with some averaging, uh, things have actually improved a lot. Uh, this is a, a more recent perfusion map. Um, it's more localized to braid activation, but once again, it's a, a factor of about two to four lower in contrast to noise, and you're only limited to a plane, a couple of slices within a plane, and not the whole brain. So that's, those are all really prohibitive uh, limits that cause it not to be used that much. And like I also mentioned, though, the, interestingly, it, the baseline of perfusion imaging is super stable. So if you have an on-off rate that's below, uh, you know, uh, slower than 30 minutes off and 30 minutes on, bold baseline drifts all over the place. And so that, that's limited very much uh, with very slow on-off activations. But perfusion is not. It's a very rock-solid baseline. And as I mentioned, a paper by Aguirre, uh, 24 hours apart, uh, you saw activation maps that look super stable. And since then, ASL has, has really, uh, I won't go into any detail about how it's sort of grown. It's exploded in terms of what you can do and how much control you have over over what you're actually tagging and what you're looking at. So there's really beautiful um, uh, maps that are that are based on bl blood flow velocity that could be uh, just sensitive to location. Uh, a big area in ASL is called territorial ASL or vessel encoded ASL where you, where you can make maps of vascular territories and tag specific areas. And so really, really nice uh, insight that it provides in terms of uh, relative perfusion in a, in a healthy human brain. And there's all kinds of things you can embed different contrasts with it as well. So there's a really nice review article that I saw uh, by uh, these authors right here in the World Journal of Radiology. Okay, CMRO2. So how do you map CMRO2 changes? So the, the basic idea <coughs> is that you have to uh, make the assumption that with brain activation, you have an increase in flow, but you also have a slight increase in CMRO2. And that increase in CMRO2 pulls oxygen from the blood and blunts the bold signal just a little bit. And, uh, and so what you can do is, and this is actually was pioneered by uh, Tim Davis at MGH in 1998, and Rick Hoge at MGH, who's, who's now in Montreal, uh, he, he did this in 1999. The basic idea is this, is that you're collecting simultaneously perfusion imaging and bold imaging uh, data. And you give, uh, in two separate runs, you give a CO2 stress of different amounts, and you measure the ratio of flow to bold. And the idea there is the ratio of flow to bold is completely unaffected by, by the change in metabolic rate because there's no metabolic rate change when you give CO2. So that causes the global flow change, but it doesn't cause an increase in CO2. So you just measure what the ratio of flow to bold is for that, and then you measure uh, uh, with brain activation, 
what the ratio of flow to bold is uh, with braid activation. And the differences in those ratios is directly related to what the CMRO2 change is, what the change in metabolic rate is. So um, basically uh, using that, so you can see that with, with uh, looking at CBF, uh, in white is the CO2 stress, which they normalize to be about the same as the, which they somehow worked out to make the same as uh, uh, um, uh, similar to bold, but and then the, in the uh, green is the uh, um, uh, activation. This is the flow change, but you see that there's much lower bold for a given flow change uh, uh, right here. So the flow induced changes are much higher than the activation induced changes. And so difference between those two points gives you maps of CMO2 change, which is great. So uh, it's nice if you really want quantitative changes in, in oxidative metabolic rate with activation. However, it's, it's, as you can see from this experiment, it's really cumbersome. And since you're dividing uh, two things, then you're dividing, uh, once again, uh, the signal to noise is really low. And it, once again, because it's perfusion, it's only limited to a couple of planes. So it's really hard to do. Nobody does it. Nobody really needs this quantitative information that much. Uh, uh, since then, though, there, I just read this great article the other day in uh, Multiparametric Measurement of Cerebral Physiology Using Calibrated FRI. Really nice review article. It's, once again, it's in this special issue of NeuroImage that just came out. Um, there, the field has advanced a lot. Uh, using a double calibration, not only with CO2 stress, but with an oxygen stress, uh, uh, groups have been able to map uh, uh, oxygen extraction fraction. Uh, as well as uh, cerebral vascular reserve and arterial uh, arrival time to get baseline. You basically plug this into a model. Um, I'm not going to get into it. But you can now get baseline CMRO2 changes, uh, which is kind of a breakthrough in fMRI. That, that sort of was one of the holy grails among uh, physiologists who did fMRI, who was getting baseline CMRO2 changes without any assumptions, uh, just with a little bit of calibration. And that that's what they found. So, like I said, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just sort of giving you a highlight of, of what's out there that's non bold. Okay, blood volume with vaso. Um, so, this technique uh, was invented by Han Zhang Lu in, and it came out in 2003. And the idea is, which I described in the words two days ago, but uh, it's a little bit easier to see here, is that at this point in time, this is zero time you apply typically a 180 degree RF pulse, which flips the magnetization down to negative one. But because blood has a, and basically this rate of recovery is called the longitudinal relaxation rate. And because blood has a longitudinal relaxation rate that is slightly slower than gray matter, uh, this will go through a null point right here where it's zero signal contribution and uh, gray matter will be have a little bit of a signal left. So at this point, you do your imaging right there with that little bit of signal that's left. And so the idea is then, if you have an increase in blood volume with activation, you have more of an L signal, and the signal goes down, as, as we see here. So this is uh, uh, bold right here, and you can see that vaso shows this negative signal change right here. And that they map out to similar areas. So when this came out, I thought, okay, great, but it's probably big vessels that are expanding. It's no big deal. It's, it's okay, but it's not great. But then um, uh, 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 further work has been done at very high resolution, at high field, that has compared directly vaso with bold. And it's found that it seems like the story is emerging that, that bold is sensitive to, and this is within a layer, bold is sensitive to peel vessels and descending veins or ascending veins and so on, whereas vaso seems to be sensitive very much to the change in blood volume that occurs. It seems to occur mostly in capillaries and, and venules, which is surprising to me. Uh, I would have thought it would be like distending veins, but it's not. It's mostly just capillaries becoming engorged and, and things like that. So, so because of that, because it's closer to capillaries, it's also closer to true neural activity. So, and this I went over before, essentially, um, you can go to higher and higher resolution. At first it looks blobby, but then once you get down to about 0.75 millimeter resolution, 
then you can start discerning these distinct uh, layers right here. And this is just one quick example, as I showed before, of individual digit mapping, uh, comparing VASO with itself, showing it's very repeatable. But then it's interesting, because we, we noticed this interesting pattern that was a reversing, uh, looks like a, a mirror image organization, where it goes from pinky finger to, big fin to, to middle to pointer finger, back up to pinky finger again. We thought, wow, how is that? And so we actually had a, a separate experiment where subjects were squeezing a ball, doing this macroscopic task, squeezing a ball versus pulling out a rubber band. And it turns out uh, that activity differentiates uh, very much in specific areas. So it's very similar in other areas, but it's very, uh, there's, there's, there's a clear division between contraction and extension in the motor cortex. And it turns out that that lines up really nicely with the, the mirror image pattern uh, of activation. So it seems like the digits are organized according to, they're, they're organized twice according to whether you're extending your fingers or contracting your fingers. So really nice work by Renzo Huber. You can also apply uh, vaso imaging to uh, looking at layers, and this is uh, work by Emily Finn, looking at uh, a working memory task. So you have subjects in the scanner. They're, they have a task of either uh, looking at letters and maintaining them versus looking at letters and trying to arrange them in alphabetical order. And uh, essentially, uh, uh, during, the, during the arrangement in the alphabetical order, you have a greater demand on your left anterior prefrontal cortex. Um, and they either have to respond with a button response uh, when they're done uh, or not. Uh, and what we find is that in the upper layers, the upper layer is selectively modulated by the demand of the task. But the lower layer is not, and the lower layer is only activated when they actually have to send out a response to the motor cortex. So that was a very, very nice finding that, uh, that maps out, this is a bunch of subjects, it maps out quite cleanly uh, that the upper layer is sort of the, the working memory maintenance, um, and the lower layer is, is the command to move your hand uh, based on the working memory. Okay, so they, so. So I just want to emphasize here that VASO, even though it has limitations, it's made much more progress than perfusion in the sense that it's more sensitive than perfusion imaging. It has the same limitations as perfusion in terms of time and spatial coverage. But because it's sensitive, especially at high field, it, you know, I think that potentially looking at layer-specific fMRI can, can completely revolutionize how we, how we look at fMRI, because now we're in, into the realm of circuitry a little bit more. We're, we're actually looking at specific layers have output, <coughs> specific layers receive input, and once you can differentiate the two, then you can start to make uh, connection diagrams that are more causal, rather than just simply, oh, this is connected to this somehow. So that's, that could revolutionize things. All right, <coughs> neural currents. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a, a joke a little bit in my lab that I always, people when they come in, I always try to entice them with a neural current project. And uh, it's usually, I, it, and usually it's kind of risky because uh, uh, doing neural current imaging almost never works. And so, but the, here's the basic idea, uh, and that's this, uh, is that uh, when you have, when you use MEG, magnetoencephalography, you're detecting magnetic fields at the scalp. Well, that started with a dipole. And somewhere in the brain, there's a dipole. And the dipole is hypothetically produced by intracellular current along dendrites. Okay, that's one model. That's sort of in the lead. And, and that current, whenever you have a current, uh, it produces a magnetic field around it. And so that magnetic field around these dendrites produces magnetic field distortions around when you're in a, in a magnetic field. There's no susceptibility effect. It's purely an additive magnetic field that looks like a susceptibility effect, but it's purely an additive magnetic field that also dephases spins. Um, it causes phase shifts at different scales. So this is at the scale of dendrites. You have a clump of dendrites together. You have a dipole. And, and, that could, and that's obviously what causes the MEG signal. But at the source, the thought is it might be strong enough to detect a phase shift with MRI. That's the idea. 
And we've done this, we've done experiments. Uh, this is some work by, well, this is actually, we collaborated with Dietmar Plenz, who's here at the NIH. He studies, uh, among other things, uh, he's looking at you know, critical states and neural firing, but he has this sort of nice cell culture of um, uh, uh, newborn rat brains. Uh, basically, they, they create, he creates a cell culture from them, and they find that they spontaneously fire. So they spontaneously just fire when they're in a solution. And we used those. And we both collected, we had them in a Petri dish that simultaneously measured EEG, and then we put that Petri dish in the, in the magnet. Didn't image, well, we imaged it, but we also just measured uh, with the whole thing as one signal. And what we found is that, uh, so here's the EEG. If you, healthy cells have this wide frequency spectrum of firing. When you add your trototoxin, it's a, it's a neurotoxin. It's like an insecticide, actually. Um, when you add that, it blocks sodium channels and it just stops the firing. And so nothing, then nothing happens. Turns out with MRI, we're also sensitive. So there's no blood in here. There's nothing like that. Um, you basically have um, uh, some amount of noise in the signal with MRI. When you add your trototoxin, the, the phase spectrum and the, and the magnitude spectrum, more the phase than the magnitude, they get lower too. So that was some evidence that we're looking at a neural current effect here. Um, okay, uh, so we've done calculations where uh, we, we just based on the idea that at the surface of the skull, it's 0.002 femtotesla, uh, and that mag usually measures on the order of 100 femtotesla, uh, which therefore would produce about, which would be caused by about 50,000 dendritic bundles. So if these bundles are clustered in a voxel, within that voxel, based on, let's, say, let's assume the bundles right along this left side, the field would fall off, but it wouldn't fall off that much uh, in a sense that with, by the time you get to the end of the voxel, you would have a, a field of about 0.2 nanotesla. So our goal was to try to figure out with, with phantoms, can we see 0.2 nanotesla? And it turns out we can. If you have a, a wire in a phantom and you turn the current on and off in a wire uh, enough at a certain frequency, you can barely see, and it, you can assume a certain distance from the wire is 0.2 femto, femtotesla, it's, you can see something there. So, so the bottom line is that it's theoretically possible. There have been a lot of papers claiming to see something, and this is just one example of, of many. And all of them are kind of like this, where you kind of have to squint your eyes a little bit and you kind of see something. And, and you know, here in this case, they did simultaneously, they did bold, simple bold acquisition, uh, but they changed the frequency of the stimulus between um, uh, 1.6 hertz and 5 hertz. And they see these little peaks that pop up uh, <coughs> within the power spectrum of, of that frequency. Um, and they're, they're sampling very rapidly, of course. And so that's, there's papers like this that are, that are you know, you look at it and say, that's kind of cool, and, 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 but not much that sort of like says, wow, this is, this is real. So uh, the field's about at that point. And, um, uh, you know, that paper, along with a lot of other papers, are just relying on just simple image acquisition where you're just hoping to have the acquisition, this case is a spin echo, line up with like when the phase is shifting right when the neurons are firing. So that's a little bit, you know, by probability that might happen, but you're missing a lot of signal. The more recent class of neural current papers uh, try to drive the signal in such a way that it spin locks the signal at various frequencies that line up with uh, neural frequencies like 60 hertz or 40 hertz or 10 hertz. Um, and they're trying to do what's called spin locking, which I'm not going to get into the physics, of basically selecting frequencies and looking at the relaxation at those specific frequencies that correspond to neural frequencies, which I think is a really good idea. Um, people are even going way to low field. This is at you know, 0.1 Tesla or lower because you don't need a high field to do this. It's not like it's a susceptibility effect. It's simply an additive field. And it's nice at low field because you know you're not seeing any bold then. So that's one of the problems. Okay, let's let's move on from there. So the so uh, this one this one's kind of a weird contrast. Uh, uh, proton density, or what's called seep, um, because uh, this has an interesting history in the sense that uh, it was only pretty much discovered 
uh, as this one researcher who's a very good researcher who does spinal cord research. Um, but he, he does spinal cord research and he realized he couldn't see much with bold contrasts. But then he realized he, if he made his TE really short, uh, he still saw some signal. And he found it to be really robust. And so this was Patrick Stroman. There's like a million papers about SEEP in the literature by Patrick Stroman. And the mechanism that he claims that he sees is basically uh, Sir Bold follows, like the, the percent change in Bold follows an echo time dependence, as, as we learned a couple days ago. Uh, however, he sees this enhancement at T E equals zero. And so my first thought when I see something like that, I think, oh, inflow. So if you have inflow effects of, of fresh blood that are not bold, that would affect this intercept. Um, and also it wouldn't show a TE dependence. But he, he thinks that it could be cell swelling uh, that are, that's causing this proton density shift. Uh, I'm not sure I really believe that without more evidence, but, um, but that's, once again, just for the sake of completeness, I figured I'd mention seep contrast. And it seems to work really well in spinal cord uh, but uh, I haven't seen it much, uh, much elsewhere. Okay, another controversial uh, uh, contrast mechanism is looking at the diffusion coefficient. So, so Libby Han, not only did he push intervoxel incoherent motion using B factors that are really small, like 50, um, he also tried the other extreme. He tried to look at using B factors of like a 2,000 or 1,500 or 1,000. And claiming that when you use really high gradients, you're sensitive to true diffusion. And the thought is, is that when, with brain activation, cells do swell, potentially. And it's known from the literature that, that well, at least it's pretty much known, is that intracellular diffusion coefficients are generally lower than extracellular. So if a cell swells, there's more intracellular fluid and that has generally a lower diffusion coefficient. And so the diffusion coefficient uh, would go down, the signal would go up. And this is what he found uh, when he did this. So this is his uh, PNAS paper that sort of introduced this concept of, of diffusion imaging, of uh, using diffusion weighting. And this curve right here is bold, right here. And first when he applied low diffusion weighting, uh, this is a B factor of 0, 150. Uh, not much happened, but when you apply a B factor of uh, 1800, uh, then you see the red line where the signal actually goes up a little bit faster than bold, and it goes down a little bit faster as well. It's not as fast as neural firing, though. It's, it's about, it goes up, it takes about five seconds to plateau in the on state, uh, and about another, you know, a little while to go down. And this is kind of controversial. I, I, my group has looked for this. We haven't really been able to find it. Um, uh, so other groups have tried to find it. Uh, at the last ISMRM, there was a, uh, uh, a, a couple of talks about it that were actually kind of convincing, almost, that it might be a real thing uh, at potentially high resolutions. It might be useful. Uh, people were pushing the temporal resolution a lot with looking at, at these B factors. So, uh, but there was one paper that seemed to put the, uh, to really sort of put the damper on the enthusiasm for this pretty well. And that was a, a nice paper by Carla Miller, uh, published in PNAS, which was essentially an experiment in which she gave, uh, she was, was trying to test whether it was vascular or not, whether the source of the signal was vascular or not. And so she had extremely high diffusion weighting, and she looked at the responsivity to a visual task and also to hypercapnia, which, as, as you know, does not cause cell swelling. It's, it's just a flow, a purely vascular response that causes CO2. I mean, that causes flow to go up. Uh, she, saw, she saw a large signal change with high diffusion weighting uh, here, which was a big argument that, that what, what Libby Hunt is looking at is might be something that's more vascular. But we don't know yet. It's still not clear. Um, OK, another, another type of contrast. Uh, so Dmitry Yablonsky, yes? Yeah, uh, uh, the thought is, is that when you have a really high B value, you're just looking at you're just looking at the cell swelling, which is happening faster. If you have the low B value, it's some weird mixture of bold and cell swelling. 
So that kind of pushes it around. Um, so looking at temperature, uh, Dmitry Lebonsky, and it's pretty well known uh, that that if you change the temperature of the brain, you'll have a slight MR phase shift. And it's it's well known that there's a there's a direct relationship between that. So uh, uh, 0.01 parts per billion per degree of degree Celsius. That's essentially the the relationship. And so he claimed that um, that looking at the a very long stimulus, uh, basically the brain cools down because you have blood from elsewhere in the body sort of circulating through from the periphery and that cools down the brain in a specific area and that causes this phase shift. And so he claims he was mapping temperature changes uh, with this phase shift. Uh, uh, it could be, it could be, but there hasn't been a paper uh, on this in terms of brain activation since this last one, which was in 2000. So, so some of these things just sort of fall away because uh, it's people, the field realizes it's kind of a dead end or, or potentially hard to prove any further. So, all right, elastography. Um, this is sort of like the latest uh, interesting thing uh, in terms of looking at fMRI. So the idea here, it was just kind of came about about two or three years ago. Uh, 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 Dr. Platts, I think, um, uh, just just figured, okay, so the idea of elastography is this, is that you, you put a head in the scanner, you put a person in the scanner, you have a vibrating plate under their head, and you basically vibrate their head uh, at a certain frequency that's pretty high, and what you do is you just look at the amount of phase shift, uh, that you, you, you can look at the phase shift, at the NMR phase shift, uh, with the vibration. Things that are stiff, you can see a little bit less phase shift. Things that are more gel-like, uh, you'll have more of a phase shift. And so you can actually make really nice maps, quantitative maps, of uh, the elastic properties of tissue in this matter. It's great for finding tumors and things like that. Uh, this person, uh, this researcher, uh, put a person in a scanner, and also did it with mice as well, uh, in which they were resting, they became active, and he found that uh, the brain actually became... Uh, so this is, I'll, I'll jump ahead to this one. So he found, uh, it was sort of a, comp well, let me just back up. He first found, he found that the elasticity, it was confusing. He first thought it, it the brain became stiffer uh, with very slow stimulation, but became uh, less stiff uh, with very rapid stimulation. And so there's two different mechanisms. But there were two posters presented at ISMRM this year, uh, one by Gary Glover's group, uh, or one with Gary Glover on it, uh, in which, and I, I usually believe most of, of what Gary shows, so, uh, and I kind of tend to believe this, that this is visual activation, uh, very clear, this is fMRE, fMR elastography, uh, very clear activation that occurs, uh, uh, but he claims that it increases in stiffness. They're using a slow on-off, they're using 20 seconds on or something and 20 seconds off, 20 seconds on, 20 so a lot of time for the bold effect to occur, a lot of time for vessels to fill up and, and make the brain overall more stiff. Uh, with fMRI, he saw it, and then the combined as well. Uh, so then, uh, so Sam Pats, Pats uh, was his name, his group also showed a, a poster that claimed that with a slow paradigm, there's an increase in stiffness or increase in the shear modulus, that's how they measure it. Um, uh, that's due to a hemodynamic effect, uh, but with a very rapid on-off period, 840 milliseconds on, 840 off, and so on, he saw this rapid change in shear modulus, uh, and in his abstract, he says, one potential mechanism is water influx after ionic changes that translate cellular osmotic pressure to hydrostatic pressure. So basically cell swelling again. Um, so he claims that maybe this rapid cell swelling, you know, cell swell, that it you know, contract and expand, uh, that might be causing the change in stiffness, which is, could be interesting. So it could be both, uh, it could be in line with what Denis Lebihan is, is saying, uh, as well as uh, Strawman with his seep contrast, but more likely similar to what Lebihan is saying. So these are all, you know, they're, they're all incredibly hard to do, and they're all very low signal to noise, so they're, they're not going to take over anytime soon. Um, however, uh, they're, 
they're interesting uh, from, from a purely mechanistic standpoint. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is um, <coughs> metabolic contrast. So, so spectroscopy and looking at the brain metabolism has been around longer than MRI. Uh, but it's, it's never really caught on because it's really hard and it's really low sensitivity and it's very hard to image with it. But uh, in recent years, but there's been a lot of sort of resurgence on proton MRI, proton spectroscopy, and specifically looking at two uh, neurotransmitters that show up quite well uh, with proton spectroscopy, uh, glutamate and, and GABA. And so there's a really nice review article, Frontiers in, in Psychiatry. Uh, and the, the idea is this, is that um, if, you have, if you have more GABA, uh, uh, you might, it's basically, so GABA, so well, first of all, 80% of the neurons are excitatory, about 20% are inhibitory. And for the excitatory neurons, glutamate is, is the main neurotransmitter. For the inhibitory ones, GABA is the main neurotransmitter. So, you know, people have done studies on impulsivity and finding that uh, your behavior, if let's say you're impulsive, uh, you generally have less GABA. Um, and uh, other sort of findings like this are really interesting in terms of just assessing baseline brain function. Uh, but the idea here is that if you give a stimulus and for a long enough period of time, you might sh shift this balance of excitatory, excitatory inhibitory input. And so that might change the relative concentrations of GABA to glutamate uh, over time. Maybe you know, people are looking at uh, the amount of plasticity uh, uh, with, with the ratio of GABA to glutamate, or how likely they are to learn something new uh, with the ratio of GABA to glutamate, and so on. So, so there's a lot of work that's done, and in fact, Actually, one of my one of my students uh, who uh, is part of the Oxford Cambridge uh, or Oxford NIH program, uh, working with Charlotte Stegg, as he just showed this this work at the the latest uh, OHBM meeting last week, and he basically did an experiment in which he simultaneously collected uh, uh, GABA uh, or or glutamate signal uh, MRS with uh, with fMRI as well, so a time course basically involving finger tapping, and uh, compared the time courses of the glutamate time course and also the bold time course. And he found that, and this is interesting, this is sort of an example of something potentially really interesting coming out of something that looks kind of messy. So this is the red curve is the bold curve, and as expected, it behaves really well. Um, but what's interesting is that the glutamate time course looks really messy until about oh, two minutes or so. And then it starts following, maybe with a little bit of a lag, the bold time course. And so there's a thought that, that potentially the, the brain starts out with an excess pool of glutamate, and maybe with act, enough activation, that pool is used up. So that now, after about two minutes of, of doing this finger tapping, it's now just struggling to keep up. Okay, it's, there's, there's enough produce, it produced, and then it goes back down. And so then now you're, you're sort of driving that pool uh, uh, with your activation. So, so that's one way of interpreting this. Um, so anyway, so that's just uh, the beginning of potentially ongoing work on looking at uh, brain energetics with, with metabolic contrasts. So as I mentioned, there's not a lot. I mean, there's a few controversies. Um, they're all friendly controversies as well. I mean, except maybe in the very early days, there were some strong feelings. But, but mostly, it's people who claim something, and they throw it out there. And people say, well, what about this? What about this? And, and then generally, either the technique catches on or else it dies. And for the most part, it dies. Um, it doesn't really die. It usually goes into an eddy that has a use somewhere. Um, but as far as brain activation imaging, uh, bold still seems like it's the dominant technique because it's so sensitive and it's so easy to do. So those are the two main things that that really cause bold to stay on the top of this pile of all this other information that's very complementary. Um, but still, we are, the the field goes for the sensitivity and the and the ease of ease of use. So with that, uh, just like to end. Thank you. Any questions? About anything. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, well, I think that um, uh, well, I think that the, that baseline perfusion. I mean, so as far as activation, bold is way better. But looking at like, for instance, baseline perfusion, I think it has potential for. It seems that the brain, <laughs> the amount of perfusion in the brain is is almost directly proportional to the amount of baseline metabolic activity. And so you could compare perfusion maps with across populations like people with ADHD or people with schizophrenia to actually get baseline comparisons of, of what parts of the brain are more active at overall. Um, so I think that has a potential application. I think uh, um, certainly the, the, the metabolic imaging might be interesting. Um, uh, anything else not uh, as far as as far as activation, not really. Um, uh, certainly, getting base. So I think that uh, the advantage of a lot of these over bold. Bold, you can't get baseline information. You can't get. Uh, you, you get an image that's weighted by bold, and but it's, it's dominated by other tissue. But in perfusion, uh, potentially in some of these other techniques, like the, the blood volume techniques, the CMRO2 technique. Um, you get a baseline map of that measure. And so in itself, that's really useful, uh, getting a baseline map of blood volume or a baseline map of, of uh, perfusion, which you can then compare you know, across populations, um, uh, whereas bold can't do that. So I think that's a really complementary area in that regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just mentioning, right? Exactly. I mean, like I said, bold can't get baseline information. So yeah, definitely perfusion, blood volume, um, <coughs> uh, possibly metabolism uh, can can sort of complete the story. You know, you might look for a biomarker that that says, oh, this connectivity with bold is is this. But wouldn't it be nice to actually be able to say also, oh, the blood volume is or the blood perfusion is elevated in those areas too, or or it's less. Um, where the connectivity is less, uh, or, or the metabolism is somehow messed up, or something like that. Uh, so I think that, yes, all of this can sort of give a more multivariate, rich view of, of disorders. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. thanks.